Uh, you'll notice that the title of this presentation and of my paper is different from the title of this listed in the program, which is Mao and Kang Four. Um, I'm provocatively using the term anti-party clique. Uh, and this this occasioned a great deal of discussion two days ago in our preparatory uh, rounding. Uh, many people thought that it was a logical contradiction to say that Mao organized an anti-party clique because Mao was the party. Um, and during the Cultural Revolution, there was one anti-party clique after another. There was the Lin, Lu, Luoyang anti-party clique in 1966. There was the Lin Biao, Shangola anti-party clique in 1971. And of course, well, one of the last ones, the biggest one was the Gang of Four. Now, I remember back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, you go to China and talk to people, and they would criticize the Gang of Four. They'd say the Gang of Four. And their thumb would be. <laughs> in other words, there was an unnamed member of the Gang of Four. So this is, but to actually come out and say anti-party clique is considered to be uh, a bit logically contradictory, if not provocative. Um, when I use the term, I use the term in the sense that Mao, personally, uh, gathered together people who were personally loyal to him uh, and planned an attack on the apparatus of the Communist Party, organization, and the government. Um, so um, I was given the um, topic of Mao and the Gang Four, but this is the way I've translated it, because I think that. Um, uh, and what I'll really emphasize is how Mao launched the Cultural Revolution and then what happened to the people who helped him launch it, what were the steps that he took. Um, so Mao, you know, the Cultural Revolution was an attack on the, on the institutions, one of the institutions of the Communist Party rule. Uh, the Politburo Standing Committee, the Central Committee Apparatus, the State Council, the Government Ministries, all were either closed down, replaced, collapsed. Uh, their leaders, almost all, were purged. Uh, many of them were sent to the countryside. Uh, the Cultural Revolution was an attack on all of these things. Uh, these organizations, their members were purged, they were downsized, thrust aside, and actually, during the period from 1966 until, well, actually into the early 1970s, well, actually until about 1969, uh, another, other organizations, ad hoc organizations that weren't part of the party constitution or the national constitution, uh, particularly the Central Cultural Revolution Group, and a series of ad hoc meetings were held to govern the country. Uh, and Mao, in order to organize this attack on the party institutions, party state institution, uh, had to go outside of these institutions. He obviously couldn't do this by working through the, the regular system, he would have been blocked. And so many of Mao's actions beginning in 1965, leading up to the launching of the Cultural Revolution, formally in May and June of 1966, uh, were, resembled a conspiracy, resembled plotting outside of uh, normal party institutions. So in what sense was this a clique? Uh, Mao relied on individuals whose personal loyalty to him surpassed their loyalty to the party as an institution. Each of them owed whatever position they occupied to Mao personally. Almost none of them held important ranking positions uh, in the national leadership uh, before the Cultural Revolution began. Lin Biao is one exception. He was a vice chairman of the Communist Party. He's the one exception. Uh, Kang Shang and Chen Bodao were members of the Central Committee. They weren't on the Politburo, although they were very rapidly uh, promoted in August of 1966. John Ching, of course, Mao's wife, held no official position uh, in the party. John Chun Chao was the head of the propaganda department of the city of Shanghai. Uh, and there were a number of young figures who became very prominent in the Central Cultural Revolution Group, which was formed in May of 1966. These were people who were writers and propagandists uh, most of them worked under Chen Bodak uh, at Red Flag 
Magazine or Junction Chow, Shanghai. These were editors and writers. Some of them had been personal aides to Mao. Uh, people like Yao Wenyuan, who later became a member of the Gang of Four, uh, Qi Ban Yu, Wang Li, Guan Feng, Wu Xin. These people were in their 30s or early 40s, so they were really quite young people. But as the Central Cultural Revolution group uh, gained power and began to launch attacks by inciting the student movement, these younger uh, figures uh, took on a very important role. Now, I also mentioned as part of this clique, and this is very controversial, uh, a borderline figure, an ambiguous figure, Zhou Enlai. Now, Zhou Enlai was not part of the planning for the Cultural Revolution. People like Liu Xiaoqi, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, were not part of the maneuvers that I'm about to describe in the months leading up to the Cultural Revolution. But Zhou himself was unswervingly loyal and subservient to Mao since the early 1940s. Whenever he was criticized in the 1950s uh, by Mao, he slavishly uh, engaged in excessive self-criticism. Uh, Zhou Enlai was a very different figure. I would say that he was loyal to Mao uh, because he put the party and the revolution above everything else. And his actions during the Cultural Revolution were one where he facilitated, he never opposed Mao, facilitated what he wanted, what Mao wanted done. But he was always trying to limit the damage, to steer things away from the more extreme uh, impulses of these other figures, and of Mao himself. He was also invaluable, he was an extremely capable administrator. Uh, he held together the structure of the state as, as it was being uh, gutted during the Cultural Revolution. He did Mao's bidding. Uh, but essentially, he was at the center of the um, Cultural Revolution power machine. The reason why uh, is that people like Jiang Xin uh, and Chen Da, who were the heads of the Central Cultural Revolution group, uh, were by all, um, by all descriptions not only extremely difficult and erratic personalities, but hopeless as organizers and administrators. And so informally, Zhou Enlai, for much of the period from 67 to 68, um, was the unofficial chair of the Central Cultural Revolution Group and made that machinery work. Now, the anti-party clique, the, the, the plotting, uh, really began uh, in late 1965. And this, this is really not based on my own research. This is based on uh, work by other scholars, in particular, Roderick and Parker's third volume of The Origins of the Cultural Revolution and the first chapters of his book with Michael Schoenholz, Mao's Last Revolution. Uh, Mao acted stealthily, uh, secretly, you could say, to put loyalists in control before he made his moves against Liu Shaoqi and the other top officials to launch the Cultural Revolution. He acted as if, if his intentions became known, um, they would oppose him. That's the way that he operated. Now, some scholars have said that Mao, uh, some scholars describe Mao during this period as being paranoid. Uh, he was worried that people were plotting against him. But if you're actually plotting against other people, you have to be very careful that they don't find out. So I think. I don't think his, his psychology was terrible, but I think if, you, if you're planning to attack all these people who occupy high positions around you, uh, you have to be very careful that they don't know what you're planning to do. So in that sense, his, his activities in these last six to eight months before the launching of the Cultural Revolution uh, were, were kind of a, a conspiratorial uh, uh, behavior. In September 1965, he sent Pang Dohai out of Beijing to Sichuan. Um, why was someone who had been purged uh, in after the Lushan Plenum for criticizing the Great Forward? Um, there were lots of calls in the early 1960s to re rehabilitate the people who were uh, attacked during the campaign against right-wing tendencies connected to Pung um, Dupuy. Uh, Mao apparently was concerned that if Pung um, Dupuy was in the capital, he could rally opposition to him, so he had him sent off to Sichuan. He had a very nice uh, little meeting with him, I think it was at dinner, um, and said, oh, you know, well, come here, everything's okay, we'll send you off to Sichuan. And so the idea is he's getting him quietly out of the way. 
Fang Zhan was someone also, uh, he was the head of the Beijing Party Committee, he was a close associate of Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. Uh, during this period, he, ex he opposed extreme attack, political attacks on cultural figures like Wuhan. Um, and in November 1965, after the attack on the high rate um, uh, play, an attack on Wuhan, who was the author, he tried to protect these figures who were part of the Beijing cultural apparatus. He also, uh, at the 7,000 Cadres Conference, had the temerity to suggest in small group breakout meetings that Mao shared responsibility with others for the famine of the Great Leap Forward. So he was someone who Mao really couldn't rely on uh, to handle the propaganda apparatus. He controlled the capital. Uh, in November of 1965, uh, Mao had Young Shang Kun removed, who was the head of the CCP general office, uh, which is important because it controls the flow of documents nationwide to the party apparatus. Had him replaced by Wang Dongxing, who was the head of his personal security detail, who would always be with him wherever he went. Um, Lorei Ching, the chief of staff of the Military Affairs Commission, was in charge of the day-to-day -day military operations in China. Uh, even though Lin Biao was head of the armed forces, the person that translated, um, basically transmitted the orders to the uh, military troops was Lorei Ching. He had a history of conflict with Lin Biao over the politicization of the military and military doctrine. He did not believe that an army uh, could succeed simply by uh, being politicized with Mao Zedong thought. He was one who always argued, look, we need modern, we need modern uh, armaments. Uh, and so there were tensions between him and Lin Biao. Uh, Lin Biao was absolutely loyal to Mao. Uh, and in January 1966, he was purged and accused of anti-party activity, and he attempted suicide. In March, he attempted it by uh, jumping off of a third story, out of a third story window. So when you see him being carted into struggle sessions late in 1966, he's being carried around in a basket uh, with a cast on his leg. Now, Mao's moves, um, Liu Xiaoqi went abroad. Mao made these preparations in the eight months or so leading up to the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. Liu Xiaoqi goes abroad on a diplomatic trip to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Burma at the end of March. He did not return until April 19. While he was away, Mao summoned Jiang Qing, Kang Shang, and Shen Luoda to Hangzhou, where he was vacation. Uh, he ordered the disbanding of the CCP propaganda department of the Beijing Propaganda Committee because he said the Beijing Party Committee was protecting anti-party elements. Uh, Lu Dingyi, at this time, the head of the CCP propaganda department, was removed from office and accused of an anti-party conspiracy. And articles, again, while Liu Xiaoqi is away, began to be published uh, in Beijing now, uh, denouncing the black line of the Beijing party apparatus. Uh, and a campaign was launched against the Peng Luo Luyang anti-party clique. Mao, after these moves, now had personal control of the flow of documents to the National Party apparatus, military operations, the national propaganda apparatus, and security arrangements in the country. <coughs> so he was very careful in planning for the launching of the Cultural Revolution. Now, this isn't an anti-party conspiracy. I don't know what it is. Of course, this is, this is the way you talk about it, because if you identify Mao as the party and the revolution, it seems to be a logical contradiction. But in terms of this kind of objective sense of the definition. He was engaged in plotting. Um, by the time Liu Xiaoqi returned from his trip in late April, there was nothing he could do. The political situation in Beijing, uh, which Mao had been quietly and secretly preparing to change for eight months, unbeknownst to him, had now completely changed. And there was nothing that Liu Xiaoqi could do by this point in time, because all the apparatus under him that he could have uh, relied upon uh, was now torn out by the time he got back. And so Liu Xiaoqi was not in a position to really do much of anything to protect himself, to protect others. Um, in May of 1966, the Central Cultural Revolution group was created, uh, which contained these loyalists who had helped Mao launch the Cultural Revolution, the attacks on political figures and literary figures. Jiang Qing, Zhang Luoda, Kang Sheng, 
Zhang Chunqiao, Yao Wenyuan, Lu Xin, Xi Wenyu, Wang, Wang Li, Wang Feng, and other were now members of this, this committee, which started out um, uh, basically uh, encouraging and helping to organize the vanguard of the rebel movements, but gradually replaced the formal organizations of the party state in Beijing as the Cultural Revolution proceeded in later in 1966. It was a highly informal and somewhat disorganized new structure of power. And again, I said earlier that Joe Mai was the one that had to step in and try to introduce some kind of uh, regularity in order. Mao was in the background approving and steering the direction of the campaign, leaving the Central Cultural Revolution Group in particular Joe uh, in charge of the unfolding uh, campaign. Liu and Deng were demoted in early August, and further in October, and Zhou Enlai gradually took control, but remained in the central apparatus and convened meetings of the Central Cultural Revolution group and others. Uh, now, it's interesting that you know, I've named a lot of people, but after Mao's death, we have something called the Gang of Four. There are a lot more than four people in this group of Mao loyalists, and so the concluding paragraphs of the paper point out the fact that while Mao relied heavily on individuals who were completely loyal to him and dependent on him, this loyalty was pretty much a one-way street. Because if you look at what happened to most of these people, very few of them survived to the end of Mao's life. The young radicals, uh, Wang Li, Wang Feng, Wu Xin, Xi Ban Yu, and others were purged and arrested in late 1967 and early 1968, blamed for the violence uh, at the height of the summer of 1967. Shen Dao was arrested as an anti-party element in 1970, and Lin Liao was denounced as a conspirator and charged with trying to foment a military coup uh, and assassinate Mao uh, in late 1971. So the only original survivors uh, at the time of Mao's death in 1976 were Zhang Qin, Zhang Qinshao, and Yao Wenyuan. The fourth member of the Gang of Four wasn't part of any of these machinations. He was uh, a leader of the Shanghai Workers General Headquarters, uh, who eventually rose into the leadership uh, in the early 1970s. He was not part of the original planning, but he was part of the January storm that we should described in the previous uh, panel. So, uh, therefore, the Gang of Four uh, was accused of an anti-party conspiracy, but it was much broader in nature. Uh, it was planned, and of course, it was headed by Mao Zedong himself. <coughs> Actually, uh, although they don't say this that directly, the 1981 Resolution on Party History more or less says this in indirect fashion. Just a, a final comment. Uh, what's really interesting about Chinese politics, both many of us here, um, uh, myself included, uh, spent a lot of time in China in the 1980s. And in the early 1980s, even late 1979, but during the 1980s, all kinds of criticism of the Cultural Revolution. Popular novels, um, investigation reports, scary, scary stories of personal persecution, uh, torture, killings, were openly published and widely discussed. And there was a campaign, I remember in 1983 or four, when I was in China, reading the front page of the People's Day, it was very interesting. Because of the campaign called Shadi Fo Ding Wen Ge. Shadi Fo Ding Wen And And it's really interesting that over the last 30 years, as, as the Chinese leaders moved further and further away from what Mao had planned for China, the, the more he's treated with respect and reverence. It's, it's really very interesting. Uh, and somewhat logically contradictory. So I have about 30 seconds left, and I'll leave that to the other.